Hello, everybody. I'm Alana Steinhain. Thank you so much for joining me for learning halachic concepts from the DAF uh, from a philosophical perspective. It's great to join Hadron's efforts to uh, continue to spread Torah study throughout the Jewish people. It is incredibly inspiring to see how much um, learning is happening all over the world, and it's great to be part of it. I want to dedicate our learning to the Kohota Bitachon of Medinat Yisrael, to their success, to their safety, Bezrat Hashem, and to the return of the Chatufot and the Chatufim uh, as whole as possible, Bezrat Hashem. Wishing everybody who is listening a lot of chizuk during these difficult days. Our topic today, you can find on the bottom of Nunhei Amudbet in Bavakama. It is the topic of being Pater midine adam v'chayev bidine shamayim. So I might do something that results in loss for someone else, monetary financial loss for someone else, and not be prosecutable in a human court, but still be required to compensate that person based on the laws of the heavenly court. And this is a really... I would say um, fertile concept to think about because it raises the question of what does it mean for a legal system not to be willing or not to be able to prosecute actions that God deems problematic. In other words, what is the overlap, the Venn diagram, between a legal system, and especially a religious legal system, and morality, religious morality? Are there places where the legal system cannot go? And if so, what does that say about the constraints of the legal system, and what does that say about morality? Does it imply in some way that some of those things that the legal system can't enforce, almost that they are um, volitional? Like you can choose whether you want to go that ex that moral mile or not. So I think this concept really sets us up for that. And what I want to do is I want to take a little bit of a closer look at this concept and how Mavar should talk about it. And then I want to think about where it fits in in general, to Chazal's thinking about law and morality, and particularly the morality that focuses on human beings feeling mutually responsible for each other in a society. How do Chazal envision being able to create a society, shape a society, where people are mutually responsible? Is enforcement always the mechanism? If not enforcement, is there another mechanism? And I think that the idea of being high of Bedine Shamayim is an interesting uh, intervention in that question. And we'll get to it. But let's just look at some of the examples, right? We have the bright uh, on the bottom of Nunhei Amudbet, where Rabbi Yoshua tells us, as we have Tanya Amar Rabbi Yoshua, Rabbi Yoshua says, mm-hmm. There are four things that a person might do whereby they would be exempt from human law and still be required to pay by divine law. And here they are, someone who breaches a fence in front of someone else's animal and presumably that fence, uh, uh, the breach in the fence is what allows the animal to uh, run away. And now this person has lost their animal and also has a broken fence. That's the first example. Second example, someone who bends their friends, their fellows standing grain in front of a fire, meaning creates a situation whereby the grain ends up being burned. That's the second example, thus also causing loss to the owner. Third, someone who hires false witnesses to testify seems to be in a situation also where the testimony of those witnesses ends up costing someone else money that would have been rightfully theirs. And lastly, someone who knows testimony that could help 
a fellow but decides not to testify, right? Presumably, again, a case where that testimony would have entitled that person to some money or not to have to pay certain money. And because the testimony never came forward, this person wrongfully either lost money or didn't get their money back, which, you know, those are uh, equivalent com uh, parallel things. So I want to say a few things about these cases, just as an overall for us to think about before we um, go into how the Mepharshim deal with uh, this concept of Pater Midine Adam and Chai Bedine Shemayim. First thing you're going to get when you continue learning, Bezrat Hashem, you will get to Bavakama Tafkuf Amad Aleph. And in Bavakama Tafkuf Amad Aleph, you will find out about something that is known as Garmi. Okay? Many people may be aware of this distinction, and many people on this conversation may be unaware of this distinction. But when we talk about financial loss that is caused by someone to someone else in a manner that is perhaps less than direct, we talk about two different types of actions. Actions that are rama that we consider actions whereby you are hotter midine adam and chayav bedine shamayim, and then actions that are garmi, which may also be uh, somewhat in, um, what's the word, uh, indirect, but there are reasons to consider that you should be chayav bedine adam. There are many, there has, much ink has been spilled on how do you determine the difference between Rama and Garmi, but suffice it to say, our Gemara, by giving us four examples of situations where clearly the Gemara thinks the relationship between what I did and what happened was not uh, sufficiently uh, we might say causative rather than just being a correlation to warrant that status of uh, Garmi, that we would consider some of these examples uh, to be examples that are Brahma. But it's not super simple. And when you get to Tav Kuf, I'm sure that there will be a sheer, maybe I'll get to give it if I'm lucky, that describes the difference between Brahma and Garmi. But that's the first thing just to know that it's in there. Second thing, I want to point out that this language in the Brita with Rabbi Yoshua, where he says that you are Potter Midine Adam and Chayav Bedine Shamayim. So my question is, so you are exempt in human law and you are required by divine law. Now, does that mean you are exempt in human law from paying, but you still did something wrong? Or does that mean you are exempt because you've done nothing wrong, right? And when it comes to being chayavadine shamayim, we're talking about maybe like an extra level, right? Almost like I don't even ben adam lechavero, I don't owe this other person anything, but ben adam lemakom, you know, I want to go to the highest level and even though it's really not my fault and I really shouldn't have to. But I'm not looking to, um, you know, get out of being responsible, right? Is it that? Or is patr midine adam meaning patr mi l'shalem midine adam, meaning I, I'm exempt from paying from human law. But I'm not exempt from, I, I, but I still did something wrong. I do, I really did something wrong. And maybe I'm exempt from paying because if the court started making everybody who did some indirect nezek or caused someone money indirectly, we would have lots and lots of problems, uh, bigger problems um, and injustices actually and forcing people to pay when they shouldn't pay. But really... I did something, I did something wrong here. And Midine Shamayim, even though maybe it would be bad policy for the court to charge me, Midine Shamayim, I should pay, right? 
I, I, I should pay of my own accord because I really did do something wrong. So the language kind of leaves it open. Oops, language leaves it open. The third thing I want to say is that it's interesting to see, you know, this Breita is actually a reworking of a Tosefta in Shavuot in the third parak. And in that Tosefta in Shavuot, you know, two of the major differences in that Tosefta in Shavuot, one is a difference that's just fun um, in terms of context. You know, in Bavakama, you notice the four examples that are given. One is about the loss of an animal. One is about somebody's possessions getting burned. One is about um, hiring false witnesses. The last one is about refusing to testify, meaning the first two are about people's possessions. The second two are about testimony, right? So, of course, in the Tosefta and Shavuot, which is in more the world of testimony, it's reversed, right? The first two examples are examples about testimony that you decided not to testify or you hired false witnesses. And then the next two examples are examples about possessions where, you know, you uh, bind somebody's um, or bend, excuse me, somebody's standing green in front of a fire or you uh, breach the fence and somebody's animal gets away. But that's, you know, that's just a contextual difference between the two. But it, it's also interesting, the language that Rabbi Yoshua uses in the Tosefta in Shavuot is, it's just some, um, I don't know, it's, it, I, it seems to me to be stronger um, language, actually. And it seems to me that it's, it's um, yeah, I'm not sure. Well, I'll, I'll read it to you. You'll tell me what you think. Right at the beginning of the third parak in uh, the Tosefta in Shavuot, Rabbi Yoshua Omer, Dalid in Chayavin Lishalim Min Hadin. There are four who are not required based on the law to pay, right? Does that mean they did something wrong, but they're not required to pay? Does it mean that they didn't do something wrong? I'm not totally sure. But this coming language is really strong. But God doesn't forgive them until they pay, right? It's like, that does not sound like you're doing something good by paying. It sounds like if you don't pay, you're doing something bad, right? I think that the Tosefta and Shavuot makes it sound more like you really did something bad here. Um, that That's what I think. But, I, you know, people could quibble here and there. But so that's another thing that I wanted to point out about these four. And then the last thing I want to point out about these four is really what the Gemara does with these four, right? What does the Gemara do? The Gemara it 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 um essentially says I, you know we don't understand really what what it means to be in this limbo state like in the middle of the seesaw where you're like not chay b'dinei adam but you are chay b'dinei shemayim right so it starts asking questions about each one of the four cases it says what well, maybe you should be chay b'dinei adam right like what do you mean if you knock down you you breach a fence that's in front of somebody's animal you just broke their wall and let their animal escape. Why aren't you chayav b'dine adam? You should be, right? So the Gemara says, oh, we're talking about when the, it, it was a kotel ra'ua, it was a, or a gede ra'ua, it was a, a shoddy, you know, kind of a shoddy um, fence anyway, right? So those are the kinds of questions that are basically asked about each of the four. Like, sounds like you should be chayav b'dine adam. And then the Gemara says, no, well, actually it's this kind of case where it's a little bit less, you know, it's more of a correlation and it's not necessarily causation in the same kind of way to something that necessarily wouldn't happen. But then the America goes to the flip side and says, well, actually, like, maybe you should have a habamina you know, that these four, now that we've sort of defanged them so much, that maybe these are, they shouldn't be chayim b'dine shamayim, right? Like, maybe they shouldn't be chayim b'dine shamayim because you really didn't do much, right? So they try to kind of fix it there. And I just think it's, you know, it, it kind of tells you how uncomfortable the concept is to try to figure out why would it not rise to the level of this, but still rise to the level of that. But I want to think about um, this question that we're asking, which is basically, if I am... Did I do something wrong, Ben Adam Khabera? And if I did, why isn't the court doing anything about it? And 
if I didn't do something wrong, Ben Adam Achvero, what does it mean to now have like an obligation, Ben Adam Lamakum, to pay someone, right? So I want to look for a minute at two different takes on this question. And I think that the two different takes on this question of like, did you do something wrong? And even Ben Adam Lachavero, did you do something wrong? Or Ben Adam Lachavero, maybe you didn't do something so bad, but Ben Adam Lachavero, you still did. Or Ben Adam Lachavero, you should still maybe, you know, push further. I think you find these represented uh, in different ways by different uh, Mepharshim. So I want to look for a minute at the Me'iri. So the Me'iri writes, Katvu Gidole Hadorot, the greatest of the generations, and by this he's referring to the Ramban, have written, Shekol Shene'amar Allah Avchayav B'dinei Shamayim, anyone about whom it is said that they are obligated to pay in the laws of heaven, Pasol Hu Le'edot, that person becomes invalid as a witness until they compensate the party that lost financially. What? He says, Vahad's very near Makes sense to me. If you are really obligated in the heavenly court to return the money or to compensate the loss, Torek Zela Chalalav. This person has committed theft until they compensate the other person. Now, what the Meiri is trying to do here is he's trying to give some teeth to this Chayv B'dinei Shamayim. Being Chayv B'dinei Shamayim doesn't mean that there's no way we can do anything to you to enforce you compensating the person who's lost something as a result of your actions, even indirectly. Actually, there are some actions we can take. It's true, we can't force you to pay back, but we can say we consider you a goslon. We consider you a thief until you pay back. Now, this is really the Me'iri and the Ramban kind of undermining the whole concept of having something that's pater midine adam b'chai b'dine shamayim. But I understand why. Because if you did something wrong, the legal system shouldn't just ignore it. If you did something wrong, clape somebody else, the legal system shouldn't just ignore it. Right? So yes, maybe it's true. When we have things that are grama, nizikin that are grama, we don't want the court to over-prosecute those things because that itself could become an injustice. So we say, you're chayv b'dinei shamayim to return it. But when we say you're chayv b'dinei shamayim, it doesn't mean you didn't do anything wrong and just klape shamayim, do something extra. It means you're a goslin until you do the right thing. And in fact, our legal system is going to recognize you as such. And that, I think, is really saying that these examples of chayv b'dinei shamayim are examples where you really did something wrong and the court's hands are tied, but we may find other ways to prosecute what you've done because you can't have a society where people can do things like this and just get off scot-free. But that is not the tack that the Marshal takes. The Marshal has a very different tack, which can, indicates that maybe you didn't do something so bad, right? The Marshal suggests the following. First, he quotes somebody who is trying to give teeth, right? Umatsati katuv b'tshuva, I found written in a responsum. Vizela no, this is what it says. Nearly, it seems to me, where it says that a person is obligated to pay by the laws of heaven, even though Beitin can't force the person to pay, even so, the court should push the person verbally. Not, they can't go freeze their assets, they can't do anything like that, they're not going to have an official verdict, but 
without fear, without forcing verbally, they should try to push this person to do it, right? So that's very much sort of in the Meiri's kind of camp of let's try to actually prosecute because how could it be that somebody does something wrong and we just let it stand? That's just not good enough. But the Marashal disagrees. He says, no, the Loni Hirali, I don't think so. It doesn't seem right to me. Gam lishna to dine shamayim, even the language of saying that someone's chay bedine shamayim, lo mash baliyot chiyuv afil b'mektat bedine adam, doesn't sound like you're at all obligated to anything in human courts. So human courts shouldn't meddle. And when I read this, I almost think to myself, well, maybe according to the Marshall's view, it's almost like you didn't really do anything wrong. Ben Adam Lechabe wrote here. It was so distant. It was so going to happen anyway. It was so grandma. They didn't really do anything wrong here. But, but if you, you want to, you know, when it comes to God, you know, we're not looking to evade blame or responsibility. And maybe the idea of being is to push us to take more responsibility, even though we didn't commit the wrong. But you know what? Somebody else lost out. And I should care about that, right? It seems to be a fundamentally different uh, position than the Meiri, both in terms of whether they think you really did something wrong to the other person, and as a result, whether they think you're even, you know, a bad guy or a bad gal if you don't compensate, right? Or whether it's just really good if you do. Right, the Meiri is willing to hold you in contempt of court if, if you don't compensate. While you know the marshal says the court can't even try to, they, they can't even try to push you um, verbally. They can't even try to exert pressure on you. But I understand why the Meiri says what he says. But I think it's interesting to consider the approach of the marshal. What does it mean to have a something that someone did results in a loss to someone else? Maybe that doesn't mean necessarily that what the person did was wrong, but we still want them to care about that other person. We still want them to care. We don't want them to be looking to evade responsibility. We want them to be looking to make someone else whole. And it seems to me that in general, when we think about how Chazal tried to inculcate a sense of mutual responsibility between people, that there's two basic routes that they go. And I'll just give some examples. The two basic routes that they seem to go are the routes of enforcement. Like, we're going to legally make you responsible to do X for someone else. And the other route is almost like um, education, I guess, character formation. And I'll give examples of, of what I mean. When we talk about trying to, you know, enforce a sense of mutual responsibility for each other. So one of the things that I think about is I think about the example, the concept of kofin al-midatsudo. That we require you not to act like a citizen of Sodom. And the examples that are offered of what it means to act like a citizen of Sodom, you know, you'll get there when you get to Baba Batra. I think you'd bet and you'd gimel. But the examples are basically where you need something. It doesn't cost me anything. And I still won't let you use my 
stuff, even though it's not going to cost me anything. Because what's mine is mine. What's yours is yours. Stark boundary between us. And Chazal essentially say, no, no, no. That's dumb. That's not what we want. We want a sense of mutual responsibility. So if there's something where you stand to benefit and I don't stand to gain, excuse me, you stand to gain and I don't stand to lose anything by letting you use my property, you should be able to use my property. And in fact, we're going to legally enforce that, right? And that legal enforcement is powerful. Legal enforcement is a powerful tool. Now, is it going to make me a more generous person because the court forced me to let someone use my property? Maybe, maybe not. But the results are going to be that this other person will be taken care of. And that's very different from a mechanism that's like, we can't force you, but we're going to tell you this is a good thing to do, right? A good example, I think, would be Lifni Meshur uh, din It's more like educational character building. It's actually, um, it's volition, it's, what's the word I'm looking for? Discretion, right? Dr. Deborah Barr, she writes this in her dissertation on it. It's a great dissertation on the topic, hopefully would be a great book on the topic. That Lifni Mishra is, can enforce everything, but we wanna teach you to have the kind of discretion that you would wanna do a little extra for someone. You would wanna help them even when you don't need to help them. Even when legally you're exempt, you're fine, right? And that, broadly speaking, is like a character development idea. Very different from enforcement. In fact, enforcing it is not going to do anything because the point here is we want you to make the decision to do it, right? And when you think broadly about enforcement of mutual responsibility and education towards discretion to have mutual responsibility, of course, each of these are going to have their advantages, right? You're teaching people to have discretion towards taking care of someone else. You're really teaching them to build their character, right? That's what you're really teaching them to do, become good people. But of course, it has the limitation of, let's say they decide not to do it. That's their discretion. They decide not to do it, right? Or better yet, they decide discretionarily to be extra nice and the other person exploits them for it, right? There's a lot that could go wrong in that situation, um, maybe a society decides they never want to be extra nice to each other because they don't want to be a friar. They don't, they don't want to be the one. Well, that's problematic too, right? It's not for naught that the Gemara suggests that the reason why Yerushalayim was destroyed, second Beit does, is because they didn't do, they did everything just by the book and nothing, right? But so you see it has advantages and disadvantages. And enforcement also advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is it's all transparent. It's all right there. Everybody knows what the law is going to be. You're going to get the results that you're looking for, but are you necessarily going to change anybody's character that way? And more than that, like you're going to have to find a standard that is kind of a very basic minimal standard, right? It's usually going to be the moral floor and not the moral ceiling when you come up with enforcement, right? Like take the example of, I don't, I don't stand to lose, but you stand to benefit. What if I say to you, well, actually I do stand to lose because of X, Y, Z, right? Maybe something that looks like I'm not losing anything. At first, we can actually see that I am losing something, right? So it ends up being, it's not always so easy to find the parameters of, where is it fair to enforce something? And I think in our machloket between the Me'iri and the Maharshal, even though they're not talking to each other, but in our machloket over, well, Chayb Dine Shamayim, is that something where you can enforce it by saying, you're not going to be allowed to be an aid until you pay that back, right? So it's turning Chayb Dine Shamayim into something that we can enforce. Or is Chayb Dine Shamayin Dafka something like the Marashal says? We can't enforce it. 
it's you can't even the the, the court can't even tell you not to do it. The, meaning the court can't even tell you to try to pressure you to pay back, right? And the significance there would be we're trying to teach you to have your HMI, <laughs> right? Meaning where it, it might be the results are not always great for the other person, but we are trying to teach you to think about what God would want from you. And I think in general, hopefully what we've done here is we've basically taken the notion of Pater Medine Adam and Chai Bdine Shamayim and we've looked at it from this sort of broader philosophical perspective of what is the way to encourage people to take care of each other? What is the way to encourage people to create a society where people are behaving well um, and not behaving badly? And the truth is, obviously, you need both enforcement, meaning law, and you need education to good character and moral behavior. But it's interesting to see the machloket that seems to surround uh, um, in this regard. Thank you so much for joining, and I look forward to our next session. Thanks for learning with me.